Welcome to Media Monitor, the show that brings you robust discussions on stories that made headlines throughout this week. We're live here on the SABC News channel. I am Alicia Jali. Good morning and thank you so much for tuning in. These are the stories that we'll be tackling in the next hour. The troubled Limpopo town of Vowani is tense once again and the education department in the province says they do not have plans to deal with the Vowani shutdown. We also discuss what is deemed as a smear campaign to denounce Deputy President Sir Ramaphosa for the ANC's top position. And also look at the continuous political killings in KwaZulu Natal. And finally, look into the current political climate in Lesotho and Kenya as political tensions there are running high following army shootings in the mountain kingdom. But first, as always, it's 9 a.m. time for the news headlines. Ben Sin Kuzulu Natal has given, uh, have given the assurance that outspoken party member of parliament, Dr. Makosi Koza, will be safe during her disciplinary hearing in Durban this morning. The provincial leadership turned down Koza's request for her disciplinary hearing to be held outside Durban following her security concerns. The hearing is scheduled to start at 9 at the party's provincial offices. Koza is accused of bringing the party into disrepute. She has also called for President Jacob Zuma's resignation on several occasions. Former ANC KwaZulu Natal chairperson Senzo Mkunu says the integrity displayed by former ANC leader Oliver Tambo and uh, former President Nelson Mandela no longer a feature in the ruling party. Tambo would have celebrated his 100th birthday next month. Mkunu has urged ANC members in the province to rally behind Deputy President Sir Ramaphosa. He also lambasted the use of state resources to detract from Ramaphosa's ANC presidential campaign. He was speaking in Kuruman in the John Taolo Haitiwe district in the Northern Cape. And Supersports United are through to the MTN 8 final last night after they defeated Maritzburg United 2-0 at the Harry Guala Stadium to a 3-1 aggregate victory. Their opponents in the final will be either Bedvers Wits or Cape Town City, who clash in a second leg semi-final in Johannesburg later this afternoon. City won the first leg match by one goal to nil. Right, let's welcome SABC Digital News producer, Ms. Babalo Lepaka. Babalo, very good morning to Morning, you. Alicia. Good morning. We'll deal with you in a short moment, but let me welcome the rest of the ladies on the main set. We do have media analyst, Professor Glenda Daniels, media studies department from Wirtz University, and of course, the beautiful Ms. Tandy Smith joining us for the first time, who's a media policy researcher from Media Monitoring Africa. Ladies, what a pleasure. Good morning. Good, good morning. morning. Thanks for having us. Good Good morning. Good to have you. Babalo, what was the biggest uh, hashtag this week? Okay, Alicia. So on Monday morning, South Africans woke up to the sad news of former ANC Youth League Secretary General Sindiso Makaka's death. Mm -hmm. And he succumbed to his injuries after being shot in July in KZN. And, you know, people on social media are basically just saying that the spate of killings, the political killings in KZN are like out of hand and something needs to be done. Mm. So, yeah. Let's and look at the tweets. What are people saying on Twitter? We have um, Police Minister Fikila Mbalula saying this morning, that was obviously on Monday, I'm lost for words yet again. The spate of political killings in KZN has claimed the life of Sindiso Makak. Mm. Rest in peace. What is uh, Remember Marikana saying there? She's saying it's rather a sad morning at ANC KZN. Continues slaughtering their own emojis there of a heartbreaking. It is heartbreaking it news. Is. Absolutely. I mean, uh, while we were dealing with Magaka's death, uh, another councillor was gunned down mm. in Port Elizabeth. So there just seems to be no end, and it's also reaching other parts of the country. What is Mabine saying? And then we have there? Mabine saying that obviously some action needs to take place, saying that while hashtag Sinduso Magaka is mourned by name and his death makes headlines, hundreds more have perished. May his death bring much needed action. Mm, all right. Do we have any more tweets? Well, we have one more tweet. Yes. Saying the low intensity war continues to claim a victim after another. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. Mm. Hashtag Sindhisomaka. But ladies, let's just, we're going to talk about this in more detail. Tandi, what did you make of the social media reaction to the news of the death of Makak? 
I mean, it's 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 interesting, and it just shows you know how how um, people are trying to grapple with the reasons why this is happening. I yeah. don't think that's being explained nearly enough, mm-hmm. and it just shows that we we needing to get more context, we needing to unpack these issues um, in far greater detail. Absolutely, Professor. Look, I think it's scary. It's part of a pattern and trend. You mentioned a Port Elizabeth yeah. a death. But in fact, KZN has got a history of this factionalism. True. And it happened even in the 90s, in the early 90s, if you remember. Yeah. It wasn't just the ANC and IFP. It was also factions within the ANC. Mm-hmm. So now what we're seeing is Makata was actually uncovering corruption in a municipality, mm-hmm. why a tender had ballooned. And then he was he was taken out. It's mafia style operations. It's very very scary, mm. and I'm very glad that on social media it's become a big thing, including on mainstream media, because otherwise these things can just quietly, mm-hmm. you know, Richards Bay just the other month. Yeah. In fact, the Morani Commission is dealing with ten deaths in KZN in one year, just this year. And it's no horrific, actually. Not even no a single arrest. arrest. It's yes. like, it's, it's crazy. Mm. Papa, let's move on to the next topic because we will be discussing that uh, the political killings in greater detail. All right, another topic that of was course. making headlines this mm. week was... When it rains, it pours. Yes, the rematch between Bafana Bafana and Senegal mm-hmm. that FIFA ordered during the week. So the Ghanaian coach, Joseph Lemty, was found guilty of unduly influencing the outcome of the match. And funny enough, people on social media are saying that while they've kind of lost hope in, in Bafana Bafana, they don't have confidence in the national team anymore. people were disputing that very same anymore. ruling. Exactly. Any sentiments like that on social media? So we have uh, more norm for we're saying, I have tried to divorce, disabuse myself from hashtag Bafana Bafana, but keep hoping things are going to change and they never do. <laughs> people are so heartbroken. And then we have another person who's heartbroken me. there. <laughs> saying, Cameron Van Rooyen says Senegal gave FIFA the link to delete the match against hashtag Bafana Bafana so it will be replayed in, in November. November. So people think it's just dubious things here that are happening, Baban. And then we have another user saying, so it's back to square one for Bafana Bafana. We only have one point. Kherinel mm, Nott says, if we want all our sports teams to do well, we need to invest at grassroots mm. level and stop the officials from stealing the money. Where did that come from? Professor uh, Daniels? <laughs> I don't know where it came <laughs> from. All I know is that person is absolutely right. The one that says back to square one for yeah. Bafana Bafana. It's okay. It's not the end of the world. We keep trying. And South Africans are always behind their team anyway. I mean, they're not dissing the team. They just fall on the floor in, <laughs> in tragic exhaustion. <laughs> Tony. Yeah, I think it's 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 quite um, yeah, it's quite interesting. But again, completely right. And I, I like Glenda's points of you know even during the worst times of sport, we seem to be quite resilient in our support for look our at teams. It, look at us, ladies, being so <laughs> fair with our judgment on this topic. Let's leave it on Bafada Bafada Papa. Look, give us the last one. What happened with that Eastern Cape mother? My so, goodness. Alicia, um, we have a mother from the Eastern Cape. She's fifty-five years old. Mm-hmm. She was arrested because she. She stabbed a man and wounded two others after she found them gang raping her daughter. Mm. So the story has gone viral on social media. She was in the news recently saying that she doesn't understand why she has to be arrested. Any other parent who would have been in her position would have done the same. What are people saying on social media? And that's the exact response on social media. People are basically defending her and saying, but she's brave and Mm. they are in awe of her actions. Mm. Mm. So we have... tweets there. There's Chriselda Didimana says, thinking of the Eastern Cape woman who was arrested after stabbing three men for raping a daughter. Mm. Worst thing to happen to both mother and child. And there's a meme there there saying, I I salute you. Mm, Very interesting indeed. Take more tweets there. King Shaka saying, the mother did what every parent would have done to those rapists. You deserve our support. Bravery continues. He says, can people on Twitter use their influence to ensure that the Eastern Cape mother who stabbed her daughter's rapist does not go to jail? I mean, Mm. brings back the question of taking the law into your own hands, but then also if you wait for the law to to, to actually do its job, it's going to take forever, if ever. Tandi? It's completely true, and I think, um, you know, generally as a country, we have this... um, this this air of 
you know, mob justice and community involvement and, and taking because on law enforcement. Because you feel that the police are not doing, not doing enough. Exactly, and that's the bigger problem. We need to be looking at, well, why is this the case? Mm -hmm. And, and how, do we, how do we change this? How do we, you know, improve our, our legal systems and fast track that? Because, Absolutely. you know, I, I completely agree with a lot of the, the sentiments on, on social media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Professor? Yeah, I completely agree with Tandy. I think there has to be compassion for that mother because in South Africa we are dealing with the worst cases of violence against women mm -hmm. uh, and rapes in the world Absolutely. So, and, and we keep waiting for the law Absolutely. to take its course and the law will take its course but often uh, rapists don't get high enough sentences mm -hmm. often they escape from prison it's, it's not good enough so you have to understand when vigilantism happens and it happens often uh, the community members run out of a township with sham box, etc., mm. to to get the victim because they scared this vic uh, the to get the the perpetrator because they scared the perpetrator is not going to go to jail. All so right. I have sympathy for the mother. Mm. All right, Baba, give our viewers that URL one more time before we go. Okay, so it's www.sabc.co.za forward slash news. All right, that's where you're going to find everything, including this show when it's done. After the break, we take a look at the Vuani situation. Do stay tuned. It seems like things are getting tense there. of abuse from the other eight um, but they haven't been ready to to pursue any angles they they've, they've offered their support uh, they've offered the comfort to the to to the eight and it's been an amazing journey it feels like your heart actually literally sunk in your shoes it wasn't a long encounter um, uh, I think at the time I froze. The way the criminal justice system deals with sexual violence is problematic. And I don't know, unless there's a fundamental change in many things, the way prosecutors deal with uh, the victim in the matter. For all investigative insights, stay tuned to special assignment every Saturday at 17.30. Welcome back. Fresh protests have erupted in Vuani earlier this week, leading to businesses shutting down and schooling being interrupted. The Limpopo Education Department admitted early in the week that it had no contingency plan in place to deal with the situation. And residents of Vuani have been protesting against the Municipal Demarcation Board's decision to incorporate some parts of the area into the newly established LIM 345 municipality. Well, for this discussion, we're very pleased to welcome, of course, from our Ponokwane studios uh, by SABC reporter Mike Maringa, who's going to give us an update on the situation in Vuani. Mike, a very good morning to you. Do tell us how's the situation on the ground in Vuani this morning. Uh, good morning to you, Alicia, and our guests in the studio. Look, um, because it's weekend, um, the shutdown that you have just mentioned now has been relaxed a little bit where people are allowed to go shopping and do uh, the necessary things that they couldn't do during the course of the week. Um, the situation remains tense because you'll remember that for the whole of this week nothing has been happening 
except uh, the two meetings that the leadership of Wani had with the ANC leadership in the the province. And on Thursday, again, they met with the Human Rights Commission to forge a way forward to see if they can find a lasting solution on the uh, recent shutdown that they have uh, embarked on. So we we are likely to see the situation uh, um, resuming, or the shutdown resuming this afternoon at around uh, 4 or 5 o'clock, and they they have vowed to carried on up until um, what the, the, the president has said is um, realized. So currently, as we speak, uh, Alicia, Vwani, Vwani is still um, on, the, on the shutdown, and we don't know as to how long this is going to last. Look, Mike, do tell us. I mean, the people are saying here that, uh, of course, the officials in the area have failed to execute uh, President Jacob Zuma's decision. I mean, maybe take us through what was that resolution with, of course, uh, the people of Vawani, and why have the officials failed to execute that decision? Yeah, indeed. You remember that uh, the president was here on the 7th of May to make uh, that announcement that Vawani will be receiving services from the district municipality, which is Lembe. But unfortunately, it looks like that was um, the uh, top-to-bottom approach in a sense that uh, the, the area that we are talking about is currently under LIM 345. And for that uh, resolution to be passed, the new entity must sit and pass the resolution because this involves uh, funds. If they pass the resolution, if the council sits and pass the resolution that Vuani will now get its services from them, it means that the budget that was allocated uh, to Vuani to, to come through LIM 345 must now be passed to the district municipality and unfortunately uh, lim 345 is not buying into that idea they are saying that they are ready to service uh, some parts of Buwani that have been incorporated into the new municipality so it is very difficult for for the province at this stage to execute that plan solely because uh, lim 345 is not agreeing to what the president has said more so because when that decision was taken when the president was here on the 7th of may LIM 345 was not involved in that decision. It was only the president, the pro Macado municipality, and 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 and, and, and the, the officials from Vendor District Municipality who were invited in that meeting. So mm. LIM 345, LIM 345 is saying we're not part of that. We're not informed. It's just an instruction that we cannot just take before there's a council before a council resolution is taken. So, Mike, do tell us, is there a heightened sense of police presence in the area because there might be fears that schools might be burnt down again? And we've also heard that the education department in the province saying that they do not have the resources to deal with the shutdown. I mean, matriculants are already are well on their way to writing their final exams. Yeah, you, you, you also recall that when this shutdown started, um, metric learners were in the middle of their trial examinations. Yeah. Unfortunately, they, could, they couldn't finish. But the, uh, the question of police, yes, we have seen um, a, de- a deployment of uh, p- police officers in the, in the area to ensure that there's um, uh, peace and stability. Uh, what, what we need to comment the people of one about this time around is that the leadership was very uh, solid in that on Monday when they met, they made it clear that they are not going to engage in any uh, violent conduct or protest. What mm-hmm. they are going to do is to make sure that services are shut down. For the whole of this week, we have not seen any incident that will warrant a deployment of more police officers. But you know, one is one. Anything can change at any time. What we experienced the other time where um, more than 20 schools were touched is something that was not anticipated. So I think that will also depend on, on, on the response from, from the government side because they have not done anything. It's only the ANC in the province that made its way there. As for government and other and other entities that are involved, they have not been two one. So we're not sure what will happen this week. Mm. And, and and we have spoken to police who indicated that their deployment of, uh, of more officers will depend on the situation. But uh, up to this stage, people of Wani have been have been behaving and they are, they are, they are saying that because the president has made that announcement, they have a leg to stand on to say it came from the high office that they must receive the services from them, not from Lim 345. Ish, Mike, thank you so much for that update. That is our reporter in Polo Gwani, Mike Maringa, giving us the latest on the situation in Vuan. Ladies, it doesn't seem like we, we ever going to get out of the stalemate mm. when it comes to Vuan. Professor? Yeah.
Look, there are two important things here. One, it's a dire situation, especially regarding matric exams. Number two, this should be a lesson to President Zuma. He can't go and impose a view on a community which they don't want. I mean, in other words, the Mercado community are leading the protests because they don't want services from the Vembe municipality. That's what the issue is all about. It's impacted on everybody now because mm -hmm. it's impacted on schools and health shutdowns, etc. But they reached a resolution. The president instituted that resolution that, okay, some of the services need to be diverted from that municipality that they were so uh, uh, going against. And the, the people are saying now, why have the authorities not implemented, implemented President his, Jacob his Zuma's resolution? resolution? Because, because that's the only reason that they stop with those protests. The, well, because there's a conflict between the two municipalities, the two communities, and some still feel it was an imposition by the president without proper consultation by the communities. So it's a bit complicated. It's a bit more complicated and nuanced than we think it is, you know, um, like the way divisions and boundaries get imposed by government and then people don't want to belong to that particular municipality because they pe feel part of their old communities. It's a similar thing, and I think also the reportage, I mean, your, your reporter was very good, but in general, the reportage doesn't give us what the crux of the matter is because they don't actually go out there and interview both sides. And there's not often just both sides. There might be three sides to the story mm -hmm. as well. The people who think this needs to be implemented and Absolutely. there was an agreement in the implementation as to why the government and why they've on, done yeah. what they've done. That's also a side to the story. Then the two communities themselves, the districts, the two municipalities. Mm. It's complicated. Sandy, mm. what do you think is going to be able to get to the bottom of this? I mean, we had seen a standoff and some people, you know, Vuani was slowly starting back to function. We've got even, uh, uh, you know, temporary school structures. Mm -hmm. The place is not even properly rebuilt yet. And now the standoff once again. Yeah. I just want to start off by saying that it's really encouraging that we're talking about this issue on the SABC this morning. Um, you know, when it started last year, it was part of the, the, the motivation for a lot of the policy changes that happened in the SABC. So, saying that, um, I completely agree with Glenda, though, in that it is such a complicated issue and the coverage that we're getting isn't unpacking um, the, the core issues. I mean, we keep on hearing issues of service delivery. What issues of service delivery? And then there's tribal issues that are also exactly. surfacing. So exactly. we never know, you know what so the what, real problems what are. The are. Actual, what are the actual problems? And I can't understand how, as a nation, we aren't utterly outraged. But guys, we've got media in Vuwani. Why are media houses not giving us the real situation that's happening on the ground, Tandy? But, I mean, the fact that we don't have a contingency plan for our, from our Department of Education around the matric exams and that is, is ludicrous. Because yeah. they were not expecting this, I suppose. But I think we, we're entering in a time and we have a history of, you know, um, um, tensions and protests and, you know, how can there not be plans around schooling, especially coming up to matric exams? Mm. Um, but, yeah, as, as you said, we, I, I mean, how a way forward, um, I, can't, I can't answer that. It's, it's, it's a, a far, com far more complicated um, scenario, but uh, clearly something has to happen. Yeah, let's come up with those solutions. Professor? The only thing I can think of offhand is there needs to be an arbitrated solution. So when you have an arbitration, that result that they come up with has to be implemented. Yeah. It's legally binding, not like a mediation. For all parties, you know? yeah. All parties. Say there are four parties involved or six parties, and an arbitrator sits down with all the parties, and you come up with the solution. And it must be implemented. And the only thing I can think of is it must be done urgently, like tomorrow, mm. and then by Tuesday this has mm. got to be implemented. Mm. Obviously, I'm being idealistic. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but people because I'm worried this was about the forced upon us, because you know how people are. The community wants to be addressed. There has to be meeting and engagements with the community to say well, that you know what we we, no. we agree with this term. There has to be. There has to be ten per people from Vembe and ten people from Makada and ten people from the government. <laughs> <laughs> ten people from the education department, everyone has to have their ten person committee sit down with this uh, arbitrator, meet a lawyer and or find judge, a find a solution and implement. All right, there it is. Find a solution and implement it. After the break, Haiz Ramaphosa's sex scandal hurt his presidential campaign.
find out when Media Monitor returns. Africans are increasingly using digital platforms for life, work and play. Information is key for us. We live in, a, in an information age. We live in the digital age. I'm mostly on WhatsApp because not all my friends have iPhones or, so they don't have FaceTime. On Network, we tell you about Africa's technology and social media landscape. And some here are using the internet to raise political concerns. Some of the exposés on political issues come from um, what you call your diasporic online media. Africans are also using technology to create. For African technology and social media news, join Ms. Pumela Lezondi on Network every Sunday at 9 p.m. Welcome back. With only two months to go before the start of the NC's December elective conference, skeletons are starting to tumble out of the cabinet. In the past week, NC presidential hopeful Sir Ramaphosa suffered the indignity of having details of his personal life splashed across the front pages of several national publications. He is being accused, among others, of keeping a harem of concubines while still married to his wife. And this, according to some, is just attempts by his detractors to stop him from ascending to the highest office in the land. Ramaphosa has put up a ferocious fight back, saying that he's a victim of a dirty tricks campaign characterized by the misuse of state resources. He has also pointed uh, an accusing finger at the state security agencies. This past week, intelligence sources told the Mail and Guardian that a unit within the state security agency is allegedly being used to target President Jacob Zuma's political opponents in the ANC ahead of the party's elective conference come December. Supporting Ramaphosa, ANC Treasurer General Dr. Zolim Kize, who has just declared his availability for nomination to any leadership position, says the smear campaigns against Ramaphosa will not disqualify him from contesting to become the ANC's next president. Meanwhile, the former AU Commissioner Dr. Nkosa Zanadlamini Zuma is expected to be sworn in as a member of parliament this week. This was announced by Secretary General Gwede Mandashe late on Friday. Hmm. Interesting developments, ladies. Firstly, what do you make of uh, the revelations of Ramaphosa's alleged skeletons? Tandi, let's start with you. Do you think there's any truth in that? I mean, it's, it's highly likely that there is truth in that. But again, like we've seen, it is a smear campaign. And, you know, I think that if you target a campaign at many other politicians, you're going to find similar, if not other, other kinds of personal histories, personal, you know, stories that, that, are, are, that could get exposed. Mm -hmm. What we have to be doing, though, is, you know, a balancing between what is actually in the public interest to know and what is you know, interesting to the public. Yeah. And we are, are heading into such a contentious time um, leading up to the December conference and then going into our own election period. Yeah. We're going to see more of these happening and we have to keep focus on what is actually important and what real issues we need to be dealing with, like Rwani and unpacking that. You know, it, it's taking away attention from a lot of the... the bigger issues that we, we have to be looking at as a nation. But I mean, Professor Daniels, the, the issue here has been that South Africa has been crying for a long time now for a moral and ethical leader. So I think the, the, the issue of skeletons being brought up is just people gearing us up to say, well, this is the kind of person that you might want to be put into the office. But what do you make of these uh, allegations or Look, whatever he, we should he, call his, them? For me, his skeleton is Marikana. I'm not saying I'm not saying having affairs is okay. It's if, if his wife has forgiven him, who are we to have that on the front page of the newspaper? Number one, number two, state security agencies were used apparently. Let's see if that's actually true. That's illegal. You can't use state security agencies to hack into somebody's private email account and 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 throw their personal details on the front pages of newspapers. Number three. It's actually one of the women who he was accused, he was accused of having an affair with eight women, and one of the women has not even met 
Cyril Ramaphosa at all, which means maybe the other six haven't met him either. He's, he's, <laughs> he's, he's agreed to one affair. He said it's discussed and it's over and done with, with his wife who's forgiven him. And so the real issues are delivery. The real issues are we need a leader that's going to lead this country out of the economic mess that we're in, out of all the corruption that we're in, and to deliver for poor people. I don't know whether Cyril Ramaphosa is the right person to do this, but he's certainly not the wrong person because he's had an affair. Mm. So these are cheap, cheap tactics by the present ruling faction to get rid of their opposition. Look, let's talk about the, 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 the journalist involved in this whole debacle now who's uh, been accused of being part of this uh, smear campaign, Mr. Stephen Mutale. I mean, is this a, a plausible, is this plausible for an, an editor to be, uh, uh, to be engrossed in, 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 in such a scandal? You know, I think that it's, it's again so representative of the sort of um, climate that we're in at the moment. We have, you know, media having certain agendas on, on various that's issues. That's true, that's true, Tanya. And, you know, it's not unusual for journalists or editors to be implicated in but political I mean, scandals. But death threats. And, you know, he, we, we, we are seeing an increase in um, threats and intimidation against journalists. I mean, that's something very close to home to the SABC. Um, and that needs to be dealt with. I think that in itself is an entirely different issue to the actual smear campaign and yeah. what's going on in Sora yeah. Maposa's private life. The issue, the fact that we are again seeing threats and intimidations against journalists is, is outrageous. And we, needing, we have to be dealing with that. Um, it, it's going to impact independent media. It's going to impact media freedom. It's going to impact issues of self-censorship because mm. people, journalists and, and media practitioners are going to see this and, you know, that, that has a ripple-down effect. Ladies, look, what do you make of this notion that a lot of people were saying, but if it was Zuma that uh, these affairs were all about uh, the journalists and, and the whole of South Africa would be encouraging for this story to come out, why is it different with Sir Ramaphosa? Talk to the media about that. Uh, professor. Well, no, I don't know. I think all Zuma's affairs have been, it's in the public interest <laughs> because he's the president of the country. He already has many, many wives, you know, many, many children. So that's in the public interest about taxpayers' money. But if there's one affair that Saul Ramaphosa had, I mean, you know, this is, this is ridiculous. It doesn't enrich my life in any way to have to read that on the front pages of the Sunday, the Sunday papers. And editors have to be extra careful about how they get used. And sometimes it's not always Do you think always was used, Professor? No, I think he's part of this faction because he also came out in, in Sanev to say Sanev editors have all been behind the downfall of Zuma to deliver. It's all untrue. That's a pack of lies. That never happened with editors getting together to say we should bring down President Zuma. So he changed his mind. He flip-flopped from being on the side of independent journalism to taking a side. And then once you've taken a side in this factional battle, you have to go the whole hog. So if somebody comes up to you and says, here's a pack of allegations against Tandy. She's having an affair with seven men. Because you're on this side, you have to then... <laughs> Write the story, seven spread men. it out. She's had Jeez. affairs with seven men. So I'm the, the thinking about that number. <laughs> that is a, that's a seven men all number. at the same time. So the point that I'm making is that you know, we how is an what's an editor? What is the function of an editor and the role of an editor is mm. to be fair, mm. to check your sources. Are these true? and to not be played and not to be a pawn and a toy wittingly or unwittingly of a particular power faction. Mm, but does, he, does this uh, 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 amount for him to be threatened against his life or no, putting no, an article in the front page? No, of course page? not. No, mm. of course not. Nobody deserves for whatever they put on. They've got, they've got freedom of expression, freedom of media or whatever. Nobody deserves to be threatened. Mm. Tandy, do you think we're going to see more skeletons tumbling out of the closet uh, as we head into the December I do conference? Think so. I, I really do think so. And it's, it's all the more reason to have a strong media that checks sources, exactly what Glenda was Thank saying. Thank you for putting that forward. We, we have to look at better mechanisms to verify information, Absolutely. especially these days yes. where you know, emails are flying around, the, the authenticity of those is in question. 
um, we have to do better. We have to be, do better to be more objective and to, to really know what we're talking about what, and, and the, the, the context and depth of the stories that we're investigating. All right. Well, let's take a quick ad break. And after that, we look at the KZN political killings. Do stay tuned for that. Cloud systems and robots have taken over a lot of what used to be done manually. Our accounting system is actually based on the cloud. Google nowadays can tell you where you parked your car. And Africa's entrepreneurs are using technology to create. With Pocket Mask Pala, you can basically do all of the services that you would do at the municipality physically by going there, but you can now do them on a mobile app. Join me, Pumele Lezondi, on Sundays at 9 p.m. on SABC News. Welcome back. While well, bodies continue to pile up in Guzulu Natal in what is believed to be politically motivated killings, and there seems to be no end in sight in the violence. The latest politician to fall is former Umzim Kula Municipal Councillor and erstwhile NC Youth League Secretary General Cindy Somakaka. Makaka was shot and injured in July in Ibisi village near Umzim Kulu, along with two fellow councillors. He, however, died early this week at a Durban hospital. A commission of inquiry headed by advocate Maru Momoirane was established and is currently probing the killings in that province. It is believed that hitmen operate from the now infamous Glebelands Hostel. Meanwhile, Provincial Community Safety MEC Mkoli Sikawunde says about 41 cases connected to the killings have been opened and so far 61 arrests have been made. As yet, no one has been successfully prosecuted. Let's find out what's going on in this clip. We all want answers. So if you are looking for an answer, you must look broadly. The ANC leadership hitting back as political violence soars in the province. Former ANC Youth League Secretary Cindy Somakaka, the latest victim. The party is already pointing fingers. The ANC in KwaZulu Natal says the killings may be a deliberate attempt by hidden forces to try and destabilize the country. The party says the investigations will help get to the bottom of the problem. We need an investigation to go further than what we, we can say to uh, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, it's a, 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 a political problems within the ANC, or it's a, a problem between the parties. And look whether is it uh, uh, isn't that we are dealing with a situation where in there is an agenda to destabilize the country, and the entry point will be as it was uh, prior to 1994. Zuma confirmed that his party will appear before the Morane Commission of Inquiry probing political killings in the province. Meanwhile, the party refuted reports that Makaka was contemplating leaving the ANC to join the EFF. What we all know that Comrade Makaka died being an ANC member. He is our loyal cadre who refused to leave the ANC and will be burying him as the ANC and give him a dignified funeral. Zuma said Guazul Natal will announce its preferred presidential candidate next week. Simpiwe Makanya, SABC News, Durban. It's very worrying, uh, ladies, that today just over 90 people have died in those politically uh, motivated killings in KZN alone. Tandi, what do you think is the impasse here? Why are police not getting to the bottom of the skirt? But that's one of the biggest questions that we have to be asking is how can there have been no arrests made? You know, and that just shows the complexity and the, the, the underhandedness of what's going on there. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, for me, the, another big issue is the response by the ANC. I mean, to throw words around like, oh, this is embarrassing to the ANC, to the party, that, it's not embarrassing. It's detrimental. It's, it's 
again, outrageous. We need, I mean, the, the responses that we're seeing, oh, these, these deaths are worrying. No, they're not worrying. It's a, it's a national disaster that we still are dealing with political killings. And, and you know, trying to understand the, the issues around, well, it's because of, um, you know, the, the maladministration and trying to... to get uh, positions and, and things like that. It's, it's just, it's an issue that we have to be, be far more concerned about as, as citizens of the country. We can't have, at, and at this stage, I mean, if we're dealing with this now, what are we going to be seeing in a year just before the elections? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Professor Daniels, just who do you think is behind these killings then? Let me put you on the spot there. There's been third uh, party factions blame third forces and so forth and so forth. And the NC they're, says they're, they're it they're can't rule killings. out the possibility that their own members are the ones conducting oh, these course. killings. Absolutely. And, and, the, the, and you can say it's them, the ruling faction, that's actually probably mostly responsible for it, but not all of them because they're part, from the other side they're also killings. But the question's to really ask what's happened to the Hawks? What, what's, what's wrong with the police stations, um, mm. the, the commanders at police stations from making arrests? We have yeah. to ask those questions. I say and this, the problems in this country started when the Scorpions were disbanded. That was an independent um, investigative unit, you know, and now what we have is a sham because it's just standing up for who should be arrested, who shouldn't be arrested. That's the scary part. Then we're just going to be overtaken by criminality, a lack of law, you know, that's going to be lawlessness. And it's also, as, as Tandy was saying, it's, you know, literally a few, it's whatever, 18 months before the, you know, the, 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 election, dra the election, yeah. election drama starts. And is that what we're going to be seeing now? Deaths. Deaths, smear campaigns and stuff like that, it's got to stop. And I don't know who's going to stop it. So maybe it's going to have to be that people go to court. But guys, I, I don't understand. The Moirane uh, inquiry, what purpose is it going to serve if you have about 61 arrests, no prosecutions, and you probing uh, as to what is leading to these or, or, or who's killing these politicians? Is, th is the inquiry the right place to be for people to look for answers, though, Tandi? I mean, I... I I don't know. I don't think so, to be honest. Mm -hmm. it's, it really, I mean, it's just, for me, it's, it's fascinating how, you know, you have any other sort of murder or death when you're dealing with a, a person in power with money and it gets solved mm -hmm. within days, you know, and our courts work in those cases. And there are various examples that you can allude to. And here we're dealing with you say, 90 deaths and barely any arrests. I mean, that, that's Im impossible if you have a functioning system, which clearly we don't. Mm. Um, and, and that needs to be a massive issue that is being targeted by our, um, our leadership, not our personal affairs of our deputy president. Mm. Uh, uh, Professor Glender, I mean, should we really blame this whole thing and put it squarely on the police's sh shoulders? Because we have heard reports that from, from the Glebelands uh, residents that the police don't come to that area because they are scared of the violence in the area. Mm. So we can't put it completely on the, the police. It's not completely. The police, instead of being, instead of being accountable to the state which is separate, supposed to be separate from the ruling party, we're finding that the ruling party is using state resources for its own benefit about power. So, so that's how things have become conflated and entangled. Instead of having all these separate institutions doing their own bits, mm. they're all being impacted by who's in power and who's giving the instructions. Mm. So, that's the scary part. Mm, very concerning indeed. Ladies, I'm afraid we're out of time, but thank you so much for joining us this morning. Professor Glendon, of course, Ms. Tandy joining us for the first time. We hope you make a return. After the break, we look at continental as well as international news. Don't go anywhere. guides us what leads us forward 
Is it the advice of our elders? Is it the actions of our people? Or the voices of our citizens? Your country is guided by the voices of its people. And your broadcaster is dependent on your voice to guide it. Get your copy of the SABC's editorial policy and have your say. Welcome back. The Southern African Development Community fact-finding mission comprising of defense and security experts is currently in Lesotho to monitor the security situation following the assassination of the nation's army chief, Kwantle Munzumunzu, by some junior officers at army barracks early in the week. Lesotho's Prime Minister Tom Tabane has assured the Basotho people, as well as the neighboring countries, that he is still in command of the troubled uh, tiny kingdom. Well, we do have uh, Sophie Mokwena, SABC foreign editor, joining us uh, for this uh, discussion to shed more light into what's been happening, of course, uh, in and around the African continent. But first, let's take a look at this upsound. Sophie, where do we start? I mean, Lesotho. Let's talk about the latest happenings there in Lesotho. Well, indeed, SADC did send a fact-finding mission. Uh, they started with the officials to speak to all the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And later, Troika, the organ that deals with uh, defense and politics uh, in the region, did send uh, a strong team where they also had uh, meetings with different stakeholders, starting with the uh, the king, the prime minister, political parties, NGOs, and other interested parties like uh, the religious organization to get uh, first-hand information in terms mm. of what led to the assassination of the army head in Lesotho. But Sophie, before the assassination of the army head, we were hearing unconfirmed reports that some of the prominent leaders of the previous regime had actually fled to South Africa seeking, of course, uh, uh, asylum in, a, in the country. Could ha that have been the first possible sign that there was trouble in the mountainous kingdom? Indeed, it was an indication that something is likely to happen. Yeah. But who to blame? I think the report... Uh, of the Troika will give an indication what led to the assassination of the head of the defense force. But indeed, we had earlier on, uh, days before the assassination, the former deputy prime minister left the country. He mm -hmm. is still in South Africa. And given reasons uh, in terms of why he left the country, the former minister of defense was arrested. And that gave an indication that something was brewing. Mm. All right. Well, moving on to Kenya, where deeper divisions have, of course, emerged between the commissions of the Kenya Electoral Commission and the Commission Secretariat over who is to blame for the irregularities that caused the nullification of last month's presidential elections by the Supreme Court. The fallout comes as a political standoff ensues between the opposition and the ruling party over who should run the polls and when they should be held. A week ago, the Supreme Court of Kenya invalidated President Uhuru Kenyatta's win and ordered fresh polls in 60 days. The court said that the commission did not conduct the polls according to the constitution. Hmm. So what can we expect as we gear up to the next 60 days? Are we going to see new campaigning, Sophie? What is really going to happen? The two leaders have started with the uh, campaigns. We saw Uhuru Kenyatta this weekend addressing uh, thousands and thousands of his supporters and Kenyans in uh, the capital city. And then we also saw Raila Odinga also uh, addressing hundreds of people uh, embarking on a campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what is currently of a concern for me is the fact that there has been a standoff within the Electoral Commission itself. That's what I the wanted to ask. The chair of the Electoral yes. Commission and the CEO. And uh, we were told later yesterday that they've gone uh, to a retreat and perhaps the Electoral Commission, they're trying to iron out the differences because so they cannot run the, the election 
when they are divided. No, they are not disbanding the commission. The okay. commission will continue, but different uh, leaders have different views in terms of what needs yeah. to happen. Some are calling uh, on the electoral commission to uh, remove the CEO. Others are questioning the chair of the commission. Others are questioning individuals within the commission. And mm -hmm. therefore, it's that kind of uh, political uh, uh, mudslinging and particularly directed also or to the commission, but also, as you indicated, the judiciary was spared, mm. uh, was not spared the criticism either. But uh, we saw Mukweng Mukweng, our chief justice, uh, supporting the chief justice in Kenya, saying that uh, I think uh, as leaders on the continent, uh, people must accept the independence of judiciary and also support the judiciary and allow the judiciary to do its work. And the strange thing is that. Uh, before the elections, uh, Raila Odinga did criticize uh, the Chief Justice. And Uhuru was supporting the Chief Justice. But just before the elections, Uhuru take a different position mm -hmm. against mm -hmm. the Supreme Court and the Chief Justice in particular. But during the elections, the observers, the international observers, emphasized the fact that they did meet the Chief Justice and they were satisfied mm -hmm. in terms of processes that were in motion to ensure that they deal with disputes. And I remember President, former President Mbegi saying he had a one-on-one -on -one with the Chief Justice and they are quite satisfied that if there should be any dispute, the Supreme Court of Kenya is up to the task to deal with the dispute. It is for that reason when there was an objection from a Raila Odinga, everybody kept saying, go to the court, go mm -hmm. to the Supreme Court. There are processes. Uh, the Constitution has set up structures to deal with your objection. And that happened. And indeed, a decision was taken but by I the mean, Supreme Sophie, Court. But I mean, Sophie, what is it going to end up uh, with? Because we've heard that Raila Odinga said he will not run unless he gets certain guarantees, either politically or legally, that these elections, the next round of elections, will not be faulted with. I think nothing is going to happen. You know, politicians will talk and they will talk and he is going to continue to raise concerns. The other side will do the same. But so they are campaigning and we are expecting that so on the 17th of October part of elections, the elections. election will take place <laughs> because this time around it's just the presidential election. All right. Well, SABC foreign correspondent Sherwin Bryce P said a sit down with UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres ahead of the UN summit, which kicks off this week. Let's listen in to what they spoke about. If it is possible to have, at the same time, the key countries uh, that are involved, uh, of course, South Korea and Japan, but essentially the United States, China and Russia, mm -hmm. if they decide that indeed it's not acceptable to have North Korea with nuclear weapons, and if they act together, I believe that together they have the instruments of pressure that are necessary to make sure that North Korea gives up. Sophie, what can we expect from the Human Summit? Well, as you had in that clip, the Secretary General talking about the current standoff in the Korean Peninsula, that yeah. will dominate the mm. summit clearly. And we expect on Monday, that is tomorrow, the Security Council to vote in a draft resolution in terms of what needs to happen. But as you know that the permanent fight five within the Security Council are not speaking in one voice. We know that the United States of America and its allies want tough uh, action and yeah. sanctions. You have Russia and China. On the sideline of the BRICS summit, both President Vladimir Putin and uh, President Jinping met and they agreed that you must continue to engage in a dialogue to try and persuade North Korea to abandon this uh, program. Uh, I think uh, even though they issued a strong statement mm -hmm. after the that test of a big bomb. Uh, some are saying that it was bigger than the one that was used in Hiroshima and people were quite scared. But they still believe that uh, uh, the only solution to this problem is negotiations. But America is taking a hard line and clearly France is likely All to right. support America and the UK. All right, Sophie, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. That is SABC foreign editor, Masofi Mogwena, talking to us about some of the stories, the developments in the continental news, as well as global news. Uh, that's a wrap of Media Monitor for now. We are back on top of the hour with more news. Do stay with us.
What guides us? What leads us forward? Is it the advice of our elders? Is it the actions of our people? Or the voices of our citizens? Your country is guided by the voices of its people. And your broadcaster is dependent on your voice to guide it. Get your copy of the SABC's editorial policy and have your say. With the, um, the stories of abuse from the other eight, um, but they haven't been ready to, to pursue any angles. They, they've, they've offered their support. Uh, they've offered the comfort to the, to, to the eight, and it's been an amazing journey. It feels like your heart actually literally sunk in your shoes. It wasn't a long encounter. Um, uh, I think at the time I, I froze. The way the criminal justice system deals with sexual violence is problematic. And I don't know, unless there's a fundamental change in many things, the way prosecutors deal with uh, the victim in the matter. For all investigative insights, stay tuned to Special Assignment every Saturday at 17.30. An exciting opportunity and an absolute must for those with the spirit of adventure is a Kruger Park Night Game Drive. The railway station itself is already a sight to behold and offers gracious colonial style buildings and serves as the departure and arrival point for all train journeys. I wanted to dress with my best color being awarded to do the Serpentine Pavilion. It's the highest um, commission in my career. And I wanted just to come and show me with my with my best clothes, and that is blue. Catch trends travel every Sunday from 12 to 1 for all the global travel and leisure trends.